Guys, this is Mubeen. Today we will talk about the signs and symptoms and the management approach to COVID-19 disease, which is caused by SARS-CoV-2 or the current pandemic causing virus. So uh, before we talk about the signs and symptoms, couple of things that we need to keep in mind. Number one, on average, for 81% of the population that gets sick, about two weeks later, they have recovered on average. So there is a good news that majority of the population becomes okay within two weeks. And you would see as I talk about it that most of this, most of the time, they do not need a lot of management needs other than supportive management. Second thing to keep in mind is that there are people who are going to have the virus and they would still be asymptomatic, which means they would have no symptoms. And that has two type of groups. One are younger children and youngsters. So uh, people in uh, children from 0 to 10 years or then 10 to 20 years of age and t even 20 to 30 years, they may not actually have the symptoms at all. They will get infected. Some people are saying that children are not getting infected. No, they can get infected. They can even shed the virus. That means they can give it to you. But they themselves, luckily, fortunately, do not develop a lot of symptoms. And fortunately, between 0 to 10, there has been no death as well. So these are all good news. However, the bad part in there is that when a child or a youngster has the disease, is infected, but they do not show symptoms, they would look healthy to you and me and to themselves. And if they are near us and they are shedding the virus in their breath or from their aerosol or from their fomite, then we will, uh, other people would continue to become infected from them. And if there are people who are older, they can actually become critically or severely ill as well. So keep that in mind. Second group that may not have symptoms yet, but may be shedding virus, maybe at a lower volume, but still shedding virus, are the people generally who become sick, who receive the virus, but they are in the incubation period. Incubation period means that we have the virus, it is replicating in us, and it is still in lower quantities that it did not cause enough problem that it shows up as signs and symptoms, but it is still being shed. That amount and volume is low, so it is not very, very dangerous, but still these folks are shedding who are in the incubation period. Incubation period, according to WHO, is anywhere from two days. That means if I get the virus today, within two days I may develop symptoms, to 14 days, which means if I get the virus today, then after 14 days I develop the symptoms. Median is 5.1 days, which is... What that means is that 50% of the population would start showing symptoms within 5.1 days. So these are the folks who are running around, around us and they're healthy and they're fine, but they are shedding viruses. So they keep this in mind, that it is possible that there are asymptomatic people who are infected and are making others infected. Now the severity of the disease. So the question that may be in your mind is, how do I know that I'm sick? And what is it that would tell me that I have coronavirus? So number one, there is nothing that would tell you that there is coronavirus other than suspicion that the symptoms that you may have are for the coronavirus. These can be actually normal cold, seasonal cold and flu uh, symptoms as well. So it's difficult to say corona until you test it. But here is what WHO has said. WHO says that out of 100 people who become ill, 81% of the people would develop mild symptoms. And so the mild stage of the disease is when there is only fever, 98% of the people would develop fever, low-grade fever, 100, 101, and then with that, dry cough. 78% of the people would develop dry cough. So if you have dry cough and the fever, there is a chance that you have coronavirus, but this could be seasonal flu and cold as well. So how do you further know it according to WHO? If in addition to these symptoms, you have been in contact with someone who was a confirmed case of coronavirus, then you are a suspect or, or you are a suspected case of coronavirus. Or if you have been in an area which is the outbreak area, for example, Wuhan or Italy or some other areas where the outbreak is going on, then there is also a chance to expect that you may be a suspected case. 
but generally if you have developed fever and dry cough my advice will be to isolate yourself and wait it out and see what happens and if it becomes uh, i'm going to talk about this serious case afterwards that is when you should go you should talk with the doctor in this case as well but in serious cases you actually have to talk with the doctor so this is the mild case so in the mild case what is it that you would look for fever and dry cough there may be possibility that you would have pneumonia like symptoms as well sore throat may be there some chest tightness may be there in some cases the muscle fatigue and body aches may be there even diarrhea can be present sometimes there can be blood from the lungs as well hemoptysis we call it but generally fever and dry cough that is a first stage if that is the case stay at home isolate yourself and usually within 2 weeks with normal supportive management drink a plenty of water take vitamin d take paracetamol maybe take some cough syrup eat well so your immune system is healthy and wait it out now in 14% of the cases the situation becomes serious and what is the indication of serious symptom is when somebody develops shortness of breath shortness of breath or dyspnea as we call it difficulty in breathing for the way we define that is that the same things that you used to do without an issue now you are doing them and you have a problem you become breathless so let's say going up the stairs or walking around in the home or doing normal things that you used to do now when you're doing it you're becoming breathless that is called shortness of breath as soon as you develop that know it that this is the serious case now why because that means the virus has gone into the lungs and it is causing damage in the lung tissues now and the interstitial pneumonia may be developing so that is when you must talk with the doctor they would suggest you to come in the hospital they would figure out how to bring you there and how to keep you isolated and then give you oxygen and take care of you so when you go to the hospital they would do for the tests on you and they would find out that most of the case according to the who the further criteria is that the oxygen saturation that is the oxygen in your blood percentage is usually 99% and in such cases when you are you are short on breath that is when the oxygen is below 93% this is why you are short on breath your body is saying i need more oxygen and your lungs are not able to bring the oxygen because the virus is damaging the lungs and so you have less oxygen to work with and you you feel short in breath the other thing that you would see or the doctors would see is that there is a thing called pf ratio and that is the partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood divided by the fraction of oxygen in the inspired air and normally it is uh, a better fraction but in case of this situation the fraction is going to be below 300 so when it goes below 300 that means that there is an issue with the oxygenation as well with that when they do chest x ray they would see that 50% of the lungs may be infiltrated with inflammation or there is viral indications on the lung 50% or more and that happens within 24 to 48 hours so all of these are indicators that this is a serious situation you will then need management with oxygen and other supportive therapies in the hospital and then is the critical case this is normally 5% of the patients usually uh, elderly and the critical case is when there is septic shock that develops and septic shock is when the blood vessels dilate because of the toxins that bacteria is producing and the inflammatory response of the body blood vessels just open up and because they dilate they cannot maintain the blood pressure so now there is double whammy on one end there is not much oxygen because the lungs are damaged and then there is not much blood pressure to bring the oxygen to every part of the body so the organ systems that do not receive enough oxygen and blood they would start dying or becoming damaged in that renal failure can occur cardiac issues can occur and other systems can start getting damaged of course lungs are already getting damaged so this is a multiple organ failure situation acute respiratory dis- distress syndrome will develop as well and this patient would need ventilation and normally it is very difficult to have a good prognosis but still please remember this 5% are critical uh, 14% are serious 81% are Uh, mild cases and out of the whole number about 4% of the people would die 
So that's, an, that's not a good number. But also realize that there is 96% of the people who would recover and become okay. So these are the cases or the stages of the intensity. So if you have my fever and dry cough, isolate yourself, suspect you may have coronavirus, assume you have coronavirus and just do not interact with others. If you have developed shortness of breath, talk with the doctor right away. And um, normally you won't start developing septic shock at home unless you just did not talk with anyone and just try to wait it out. Um, septic shock usually from serious to critical occurs in the hospitals and that is where the ventilation would be needed. Now, what is the management? It is a new virus. We do not have a vaccine for it. They are trying to create a couple of ways. There are many, many researches that are going on for the vaccines, but the couple of ways that they are creating vaccines are, number one, the virus has a protein called a spike protein that binds with our ACE2 receptors on our cells, and that binding causes the virus to be pulled into the cell. So they are trying to see that can they do something with this uh, spike protein and kind of um, block it in some way or damage it in some way so it cannot bind with the ACE and it cannot be pulled in. So that is one way to create vaccines and they're working on it. The other one is that they are looking at the people who got infected, developed immunity, became recovered, and now we are taking their plasma, their serum, their blood, and we are seeing if they have antibodies against the spike proteins in them. And we are trying to then manufacture those spike proteins for masses. So these are just a couple of ways. I'm sure that there are more other ways as well that vaccines are being developed. But we do not have a vaccine today. And also please remember SARS-CoV, the species that was 2002 to 2004, any immunity to that does not give immunity to SARS-CoV-2. That means these are two separate modified viruses. So that immunity or those antibodies do not work with this one. On the medical side, on the antiviral side, there are a couple of drugs. So first I want to talk about the WHO's message. So I have the WHO's message here. They said there are no known effective antivirals for coronavirus infection. This is directly from the WHO site. And with that, they say various conditions with potential anti-NCOV activities are being evaluated, various candidates for the clinical trials, use of unregistered or unproven therapeutics for coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2 should be done under strict monitoring and ethical approval. So, uh, and they have given the, uh, uh, the, given a message there to look at the module 15 and of course there is no module 15 over there. So anyways, that is a gap on their end. The two drugs that have been used without approval or without prescription by WHO are remdesivir and uh, chloroquine. There are more, but these are the two that are becoming more popular. Chloroquine is a drug that has been used for malaria and HIV or AIDS as well. It is an interesting drug. What it does is it goes into our cells and vi virus uses parts of our cells machinery to make more viruses. So this drug goes in them and increases their pH. That means it makes them less acidic. And virus needs a little more acidic environment to work in. So when the pH is increased, the, the, the environment is less acidic, virus cannot replicate very well. So that is one way that chloroquine reduces the replication frequency of the virus. And it is known to have done that with SARS-CoV, the previous one. This one, does it do or not? They are doing a lots of uh, limited trials and they're trying to do studies on that. The second thing that chloroquine does, which is really very interesting, is that remember the ACE2 receptors I talked about, that our cells have ACE2 receptors which have the spike protein from the virus and it pulls it into the cell. The chloroquine takes one last part of the receptor. When the receptor is being formed, it takes its last part and does not let it become glycosylated. So that's a medical term, but there is not, glucose attachment is removed. So the shape of the ACE2 is not exactly the same as normal. And that somehow negatively impacts the binding. So virus binding reduces, which then of course pulling of the virus in the cell reduces as well. So that is what chloroquine does with SARS-CoV. They are thinking that it may help the same way with SARS-CoV-2 as well. So that is what is going on with chloroquine. 
Then is the second drug is the remdesivir. Remdesivir is also a an antiviral, again not for SARS-CoV-2 virus, but they are hoping that this would work. And what the, the, the way this drug functions is that the coronavirus or the SARS-CoV-2 carries an enzyme with it. So let's say this is an enzyme it carries with it. This is called RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. This enzyme, when the virus goes in our cell, this enzyme does the first function to make copies of the RNA or it creates messenger RNA from the existing RNA of the virus and then the copies start. Remdesivir blocks this enzyme of the virus. So this enzyme cannot make messenger RNA and then the virus cannot become replicated and somehow, so by this mechanism, the virus replication or division, or not division, multiplication reduces or stalls. So that is the way remdesivir work in general as an antiviral. They are hoping that it would work for the uh, corona or SARS-CoV-2 as well. So this is the summary of signs and symptoms and management. Supportive management for mild cases are stay at home, stay hydrated. You may take paracetamol for, for fever. You may take cough syrups. You may have to take lots of water, 8-10 glasses of water. Stay well fed and just take rest. 81% of the cases you'll become fine. In the remaining cases, you may need to go to hospital. Again, for 14% of the cases, you would need oxygen three, four weeks in the hospital and you're fine. In 5% of the cases, there may be ventilation and there are folks out of that that unfortunately may not make it. So please make sure that you do not come in contact with older people because they are at a higher risk. So do not put them at risk. They are your parents, they are grandparents, your family, friends, colleagues, whoever, strangers. Don't put them at risk. If you're a youngster, this is your responsibility. Because you may have infection if you're a youngster. You may be giving it out. You may be asymptomatic and or very mild symptoms. Enough mild that you won't even think to go to the doctor. But in that process, you might make others sick, which may lose their life if you're not careful. So just be very careful. And this is what the sign symptoms and management is. Thank you very much for your time.